Hi, my name is Joan Stites. I'm a professor at Yale. And what I'd like to tell you about today is the importance of serendipity in the discovery process in science. The story I'm going to be telling you has to do with SNRPs, which are little particles inside all of our cells that are the building blocks of the spliceosome, which assembles on pre-messenger RNAs to remove the introns and make the messenger RNA that can be translated by the ribosome. And these little SNRPs, as you see in this slide, have both RNA molecules and protein molecules in them. The other way in which the story is unusual is that it's definitely not a bench to bedside story. Instead, it's very much a bedside to bench story where we made use of something that physicians had known about for a long time in order to make discoveries about the basic workings of cells. So the story starts in the early 1970s. And at that time, of course, we knew about the central dogma. We knew that DNA made RNA and RNA made protein. What we didn't know about was introns or splicing. People had worked out many of the steps in gene expression in bacterial cells. And most people thought that higher cells would be sort of similar, perhaps a little bit more complicated, but no new principles, how wrong we were. What we did know in the early 1970s was that there were several things that were peculiar about higher cells. We knew that they had way too much DNA, 100 to 1,000 times more than we thought they would need in order to encode the number of genes that we thought we had. And the other thing was that RNA, lots of it got made in the nucleus, but about 90% of it got degraded and only 10% of it ever made it out to the cytoplasm to be a messenger RNA. So what was going on? And as a young assistant professor at Yale, I had studied RNA structure and function in bacteria and bacteriophages, and I decided I wanted to take on this problem on my first sabbatical leave. We knew that there were RNA binding proteins inside mammalian cell nuclei that immediately bound to the newly synthesized messenger RNA. And I thought if I had antibodies against those proteins, I could use them as tools, and maybe this would help me figure out how the cell decides which molecules to degrade and which molecules to send out to the cytoplasm as messenger RNAs. So for half a year, I tried to make antibodies against these nuclear RNA binding proteins, but this was without success because these are very highly conserved proteins and therefore very non-immunogenic. So I gave up and did something else for the rest of my sabbatical. But it was the year 1977 in the summer that introns were discovered. Evidence came together from laboratories all over the world that conclusively convinced everyone that our genes, in fact, were not like bacterial genes, but contained segments of nonsense, the so-called introns, and that these introns were then spliced out once the entire gene was made into pre-messenger RNA. And that was what enabled the cell to send a fully formed message to the cytoplasm to be translated by the ribosomes. So the question then was, what is a cellular machinery that very precisely recognizes the ends of the introns and allows the splicing process to be exact? When I went back to my lab in the fall of 1977, everybody wanted to work on this process. We were an RNA lab, but frankly, we were pretty clueless about what we should do next. And then came the first piece of serendipity. In January of 1978, a new issue of the journal Nature arrived in the lab with this rather complicated title. But the important point was the underlying sentence here, which says that patients with MCTD, mixed connective tissue disease, have antibodies against nuclear RNA protein complexes. And this caught my attention because while I was trying to make antibodies and failing, several people had said that they thought they'd heard of some diseases where patients made autoantibodies, antibodies against their own cellular components, that reacted with nuclear RNA protein complexes. At that time, I had in the lab a new MD-PhD student, Michael Lerner. 
He was fresh from his medical school courses, and I said, Michael, do you know anybody here at Yale Medical School who might have patients with these diseases? And he said, sure, I'll go see Hardin. Hardin was right across the street in the rheumatology section, and that very afternoon, Michael came back with several small vials of serum from patients with suspected autoantibodies. Now, the sobering part of this story is, if this were to happen today, one would have to spend weeks, if not months, filling out human investigation forms, getting it through committees, in order to use even just a few milliliters of serum from a patient in an experiment. So this probably never would have happened. But in any case, Michael started working with these sera, and the idea was that the autoantibodies would then recognize the cellular component, and we would use them as tools to both characterize the, um, to purify and to characterize the function of the target of the autoantibodies. And here what you see in this picture is the idea that maybe RNA was in there and protein as well. And we now know that those were SNRPs and that patients with lupus and other autoimmune diseases often make antibodies against SNRPs. However, the going was rough. As Michael purified, the cellular component kept disappearing. We now know because ribonuclease was in the preparations and kept eating away at the RNA component. And then the second piece of serendipity happened. And this was a seminar visit by Joan Brugge, who is now a professor at Harvard Medical School. And she came and talked about a new reagent called protein A that she was using to capture immune complexes made with lysates of virus-infected cells and antibodies against those proteins. And the advantage of that was it could be done very fast. And you could also look at radioactively labeled cell lysates. And what we see here is that on the very far side um, is the total RNAs in a nuclear extract of HeLa cells labeled with P32 going from the very small ones at the bottom, about 70 nucleotides long, up to U2, which is about 200 nucleotides long. Michael's own serum, which was used as a control in the next lane, immunoprecipitated no RNAs, but what you see on the right-hand side here is the pattern that he obtained with various different autoantibodies from various patients. And for the first time, we could see what the RNAs were, and then we could also use this to find out what the proteins were in these little particles. So what we now know is that these very highly conserved and very abundant targets of the autoantibodies are, in fact, the SNRPs that by base pairing, recognize specific sequences in the pre-messenger RNA, gather together with a lot of other factors to form the spliceosome that carries out the two-step reaction that's involved in pre-messenger RNA splicing to give, finally, the messenger RNA that can be translated into protein. This isn't just test tube fiction. Here you see a beautiful picture from Ann Byer's lab in Virginia showing DNA with nascent RNA transcripts coming off it, particles building up at the five prime and three prime ends of an intron, coalescing to form a spliceosome with the intron looped out, which will then shortly be removed by the actual chemical process of splicing. So what I've told you is about how serendipity and being interested in RNA protein complexes in mammalian cells led to the discovery of SNRPs, which contain snRNAs and proteins, and how that process is essential for making messenger RNAs. So these snRNAs are, in fact, the first non-coding RNAs that we know to be important in the regulation of gene expression. Today we have microRNAs, lots and lots of others. And also, as we've understood about the splicing process, we know that splicing is the reason why we can have the same number of genes in our genome as the fruit fly Drosophila and yet be more complicated. And this is because we do splicing in alternative ways, therefore making the most out of every gene, making multiple products from every gene.